You thought that you could have it all And life could be a ball But you fell and scabbed your knee Now you can be free Hello and welcome. My name is Derek, uh, the recovering CEO. Welcome to our podcast and video podcast. I'm here with a very special guest today who actually has longer term sobriety than me, and I've known her for a long time, and she's wonderful. Her name is Michelle. How are you, Michelle? Fantastic. I'm really glad you asked me to come on uh, the show. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you're a special guest, uh, Michelle V. And uh, so I guess tell our listeners, when... Did you get sober and why did you get sober? Yeah, uh, my sobriety date is September 29th of 1990. And uh, it's, you know, my story is a little bit unique in that there was some recovery around me when I was young. And uh, so there was at least some awareness in my household from the time I was about middle school ish. And uh, my Mother had gone to uh, Al-Anon as a direct result of the fact that both of my parents' families were riddled with alcoholism and, and much, much codependence. And my mother recognized that she was not able to uh, handle, handle the way things were uh, without some help. So she started attending Al-Anon. So there was some awareness in our household uh, for my, I have an older brother. Um, so he and I had some awareness of recovery, although it was really peripheral and, but a little bit of education, a little bit of uh, information that did sort of filter in through my thick skull at the time. And so when I started seeing indicators in myself, you know, uh, in, in recovery, how we talk about, uh, you know, head full of AA will, and a bully, belly full of liquor will, uh, really make for a miserable, miserable combination. I had some of that before I ever took my first drink. So that was fun. But um, so little, little uh, bits of information like blackouts aren't normal. And if you think about drinking and plan for drinking, plan for drugging more than you would plan for dinner um, or, or any other normal activity that there might be, might be an issue. Um, so just having that little bit of information to roll with, I started to see that uh, there might be an issue, that it wasn't normal to be surrounded by alcohol all the time and it wasn't normal to have blackouts. So when I started having them, um, yeah. I, I had AA in my head already. Well, so, so that's interesting because like when I came in, when I, A was not even in my vocabulary. I never used the word alcoholic. I never thought, I never thought my problem was drugs or alcohol. So, you know, it took me a few years of, falling on my face to realize maybe I have a drinking problem or maybe it's the drugs, but you, I think uh, maybe that's one of the reasons you were able to get sober so young is because you had some of this forewarning, some of the education about it, you think? It absolutely it had everything to do with it, that I had some idea of where I could find AA meetings because my mother had been going to Al-Anon and I knew that there were AA meetings happening in those locations at the same time. But, um, but really it was, the information that I had gotten from going to a few Alateen meetings that uh, she, my mother essentially dragged my brother and I to, uh, and we went, um, and, but some information soaked in, even though I wasn't a hundred percent willing participant, um, some, some information got in there and that, the, that information really did make the difference. It might not have gotten me sober at that time if other things hadn't lined up like the stars hadn't aligned in some other ways as well, but um, it definitely at least got me to a meeting because the blackouts, I was able to sort of ignore them for a while and uh, sort of pretend, you know, I, I didn't have a good memory and, you know, just sort of ignore it and pretend they weren't really happening. But then a couple of them were a little more lengthy and, um, it, it was something I, I couldn't get that information out of my head. And really outside of, outside of the blackouts, none of the rest of the things that happened when I was drinking really concerned me at all. So um, if I hadn't already heard that 
several times that that's not normal. That uh, I, I don't believe I would have gone to a meeting for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So was there any one particular incident or was it just having a few blackouts that you realized this isn't good for me type thing? Well, no, there were incidents <laughs> um, <laughs> there towards the end. It wasn't the last time I drank, but um, there there was some very dramatic. Actually, actually, what bothered me more was some, were some things that happened. Say, I consider uh, blackouts and brownouts. Brownouts mm -hmm. that I can remember some of what happened, but I had zero control. It was as if I was just uh, watching as opposed to an active participant. And the blackouts actually didn't bother me that much because usually after the fact, maybe I was mouthy, maybe I, you know, but nothing, nothing too terrible. But this one particular incident, uh, there was uh, like, so what I considered a, a brownout where I had no control over what was happening. And I was, it was like, I, I was watching an actress um, live my life and um, participate in things I would never normally do. I mean, this was, you know, going out with people that I didn't know. And, um, you know, I ended up um, sleeping with somebody I didn't know and, and, and had literally no control in the situation. I was, like I said, it was this it, actually pretty terrifying just watching and, and not having any control and actually in the, in the middle of activity, and I've heard people talk about this, like coming to while they're awake, while they're walking around talking. And that's, that's kind of what happened to me. Although, like I said, it was this sort of brownout to kind of where I all of a sudden was sort of myself again, not sober, but sort of myself again. And, um, and just completely separated myself from the situation I was in, but it was, it was, it was a pretty terrifying experience. It, it was not the last time I drank though, but it was enough to worry me. Wow. Wow. And that was, you said 1990. So do you actually, do you remember the feeling of that? Do you remember the feeling of kind of that loss of control and um, fear, I guess, that raised your awareness? <laughs> I, I do. Honestly, yeah. I was feeling it uh, when I was talking about it. It was um, just one of the scariest things I've ever felt. And honestly, obviously, it was a long time ago. And I have, have gone through a lot of life since then, including having having a family. And, um, you know, there's, there's very little that has ever scared me that much. And uh, I, I think anything less than that, I would have been able to ignore for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, you know, I always, yeah, because I know you're a mom and you have a couple wonderful children and you're mm -hmm. married. I'm married too. I have two daughters. Um, but it's, you know, the value of being raised with good morals or good values, right? And, and it's when I was in my addiction, just reflecting a little bit, you know, I mm -hmm. found myself doing things that I didn't think I would normally do. You know, it, it made me do things that I, I knew were against my morals. And eventually that, when that bumps up against something, then it, it creates awareness that there's something wrong, you know? So it's kind of like, uh, going, you know, they talk about a God of your understanding or higher power of your understanding. Like when I'm going against, uh, God's will or what the universe's will is for me, I can feel that conflict. Um, which was often when I was in my addiction. So if I'm out of my addiction, then I can kind of go with the flow. And, and it sounds like, all the way back in 1990, you eventually got sober and your life started kind of flowing a little bit more. Can you talk about that transition? Yeah, well, because I, I was very young at the time, um, I, I, I see some people who maybe uh, had some stability as adults before they got into their drinking and addiction. So they had some maturity. Um, Why well, didn't have any of that in my using or my recovery for the first few years, um, because I, I was 16, uh, when I got sober and getting, getting sober, that was, that was an interesting experience in and of itself. And that I, so I, I, I did end up going to a meeting that I was aware of. And then I went to another meeting, um, and it felt 
I felt at home in a way that I would have a hard time explaining it to somebody who hasn't experienced it themselves, that I felt comfortable in my own skin for the space of an hour. And, you know, from prayer to prayer, the second that, you know, and closing prayer was done, I was out like a shot. Um, did not want to talk to anybody, did not want anybody to necessarily see me, but, um, but I felt more comfortable in my own skin than I had in, in years. And that was something, but had I not been seeing a therapist at the time, because my parents were, uh, had, had, uh, gotten divorced and my, my mother wanted us both, my, my brother and I to, uh, see a therapist. And if it weren't for the therapist's reaction, I'm not sure if I would have stuck with it initially. Um, when I told him I'd gone to an AA meeting, his reaction was good. And I thought no one had any idea that I, there was really much of anything going on. I mean, granted, I had ever stayed out all night and, and worried my mother to death. Granted, you know, things had happened, but no one else in my life, including my mother, was really sure anything was really wrong. It was just normal teenage whatever. Um, and he was the only one who was very definitive in his reaction. And uh, it turns out he's... He's a recovering alcoholic, ah. and uh, whom actually uh, I, a few years ago I tried to track down. One of these days, maybe I will, and because uh, I because I really would like to thank him because that was exactly what I needed at the time. That's but, wonderful. Uh, one of the yeah. ways, yeah. I mean, it's um, just just one of those things that just line up exactly the way we need them to, um, and because of that, I just continued to go to meetings and never once did I leave a meeting and think I couldn't relate to anything. That never happened. <laughs> not, not, not then, not now. Um, but being sober that young was weird. Um, I was got sober in Dearborn and there were no young people in the area. So the youngest person I saw going to meetings there at that time was mid twenties. And so that was, there was a big enough gap, but actually it worked out okay because instead of feeling alienated, I actually had some, some really wonderful old timers. And when and I use the word, you know, the term old timers, I mean it the way we use it in AA, which is simply that um, this is someone who's got a lot of time sober. And uh, so I had these wonderful old timers who sort of adopted me took me under their wing and decided they were going to take me out, out to coffee after the meetings and make sure that, uh, you know, if I, if I asked for it, that I had rides to any meetings that I needed to get to, cause I wasn't driving at the time. And it wasn't cause I lost my license. It was cause I hadn't gotten it yet. <laughs> so, um, but I really was, um, just cared for honestly, beautifully by, by some old timers in the area and they, also, um, fairly quickly within the first six months, got hooked up with some uh, young people's groups that were in the Southeast Michigan area and really just you know, found, my, found my place, found, found people who were in similar situations, who were also getting sober in high school, that even though it was unusual, it wasn't unheard of. I certainly wasn't the only one by far. And uh, so I found some other young people who had, had gotten sober and were actively trying to stay sober. Mm -hmm. And it was a really good, very needed um, support for me at the time. Wow. Yeah, that's wonderful. I think uh, I love the old timers that, you know, I can say from experience, and I'm sure you know too, like watching someone come into AA and grow up in the program is such a gift, right? And um, I'm sure you must have been quite a gift when you came in and then they saw you grow over the years and you know that's 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 what it's all about right is helping others and then you know carrying the message um so i can't imagine yeah. being 16 so you still have your high school you're still now you think when you quit drugs and alcohol you can't have fun anymore i mean were you still able to have fun did you uh find a good sober life out there oh absolutely now in high school i was very awkward <laughs> so this was uh with the people that I grew up with, by the time 
I was in high school and it was all me at that point. Um, I realized during my senior year that it was all me. But at that point, I felt awkward enough with those people that I didn't know how to be around the people I grew up with sober. That anytime I interacted with the people I went to high school with, if we weren't, if we were outside of a classroom setting, I was always drinking if I was around people I went to school with because, but that was, that was absolutely my own being uncomfortable in my own skin and having a very low opinion of myself at the time. And um, that the way that translated in early sobriety is I spent time almost exclusively with people in recovery and that was okay. That I think that was what I needed at the time. I wasn't trying to be social with peers who were not in recovery. I wasn't trying to spend time doing a lot of things that were outside of what needed to happen, you know, just school and basic, you know, care and feeding of a teenager and uh, um, my recovery. So I wasn't doing much outside of that. And that was, I think, perfect for the time. But then I, I realized later that where I thought these were, you know, some rather rotten people that I had grown up with, that it was mostly me. <laughs> some some of them were, you know, not not fabulous, but because they had their own issues. Um, but then there were some really great people that I grew up with, and I just didn't realize they were pretty great people until, well, until we were getting close to graduation. And I finally, because of recovery, uh, started to get over myself a little bit and, and realized that not everything was about me. And uh, that was very helpful. But um but it was it was very late it, um, in my high school career before I figured that out. So um, the good news, bad news, the bad news for me was simply that I, I never gave myself much of an opportunity to get very close to the people that I grew up with in in that setting. But the amazing thing is that I have had the opportunity to have friends that I refer to as lifelong friends that are from when I first got sober. Actually, one of my, one of my best friends now, today, I met in the first few months sober at, at a meeting and um, that we're still close friends today. And so those are the people I refer to when I'm saying, you know, people I grew up with. Oh, that's that, inc that's so, incredible. Um, t yeah. Tell me a little bit about, bit about that friendship. You said one of your best friends you met in a meeting and you've stayed mm -hmm. friends this long. T t I'm very yes. curious. Well, um, it was one of those young people's meetings. And um, although, although I do have people that I know well, who I still see occasionally from other meetings that I went to, but the people I got closest with are, you know, like, like we tend to do are people I had more in common with. And um, this woman, her name is Terry, and she was at uh, one of the young people's meetings I went to, West Side Young People's Group. And um, I'm cannot remember the name of the church. I'd have to look it up, but it was in Livonia. Mm -hmm. And um, she just, she was really involved in the group when I got there. She had been going to that meeting for a little bit before, before the first time I attended. And I was terrified and yet I wanted to be right in the middle. So uh, yeah, I wanted the attention and also just to be connected. So getting involved in that group meant getting to know Terry and, and some others just getting to know them better, spending time with them, simply the act of getting more involved in the group. And then we started to do all kinds of things outside of that meeting. There were sober campouts and conferences, young people's conferences. We actually uh, put together a host committee for the Michigan Young People's Conference, Mickey Paw. And um, that was quite a process. That was a, that was a few years later, but, um, but initially it was small. It was a, oh, we're all going to go out to dinner uh, or we're all going to go out for coffee. Or we did some ridiculous things like, you know, we were ridiculous teenagers, just sober. We would stay up all night and then go to the Looney Baker and get hot, um, <laughs> hot, donuts. hot, hot bear claws. First yeah. thing in the morning was my favorite. So we, <laughs> awesome. uh, we actually had a lot of fun. And one of, and one of those, uh, one of those folks, um, uh, Joe, who, is no longer with us, actually, um, but uh, taught me how to drive a stick shift in the Looney Baker parking lot. 
That's funny. Yeah, a bunch of uh, my brother's fraternity from Michigan would always they drive to the Looney Baker drunk, <laughs> and they would like right. get all get all goofy in the parking lot. I'm like, I think it was just an excuse to get donuts. But yeah, I used to go to meetings in Livonia too because I kind of grew up right around Livonia, uh, the border, like eight in Newburgh. So I, I went to Novi meetings, Livonia meetings, like that whole. Well, Livonia had a bunch, and, and North uh, Novi had a bunch. So I pretty much those. But yeah, that's great. Yeah, when I was uh, younger, before I had a family, before I had you know all of the adulting responsibilities, um, I went to meetings all over. I went to Redford. Um, I went to Downriver, a few different places in Dearborn. Um, for some reason, I did not come out to the Ann Arbor area though almost ever, which is hysterical to me now since, you know, moving here. But um, I, I went just all over when, when I think about now the geographic area covered by all the different meetings I attended at various times. Um, this was quite a lot, quite a lot of uh, um, space, but it was one of the things that, um, made it fun for me when, when I, especially those first few years, cause like you were saying, I needed it to be fun. I needed to know that I wasn't losing anything by getting sober. I wasn't missing out on anything. And, and the truth is I missed out on so much when I was drinking because I was afraid. I drank because I was afraid. I, I didn't like myself and, and I really had just a lot of fear and anxiety and it went away when I drank. It went away when I smoked pot and, um, but then, you know, it would come rushing back and then I felt guilty. Um, and then of course there were those fabulous times when I would do things that I wouldn't normally do things that I was ashamed of. And, and then, so then you add that on top of the existing fear and anxiety. And it was, of course, it was, it was awful and, mm -hmm. and kept getting worse. And that was, that was mounting, but. So it's, it's interesting how when we get sober, we think, you know, we don't want to miss out on things. And I'm like, we don't want to miss out on things like what? Randomly sleeping with strangers and ending up somewhere and potentially, you know, getting murdered and yeah, yeah. Missing out on all kinds of things. <laughs> wow. And so back then you really, you got sober when it was all smoking meetings, pretty much. <laughs> it was actually. And of course those, the, uh, you know, newcomer, uh, uh, service commitments are, uh, you know, cleaning ashtrays, cleaning ashtrays and, and, uh, you know, cleaning up the chairs after, at the end of the meeting. But yes, I cleaned a lot of ashtrays. And what's funny is I never smoked cigarettes. Mm. I smoked marijuana, but I never smoked cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, uh, and that's was disgusting, but yes, I cleaned many an ashtray. Well, it's funny. Cause I remember going to like a 10 30 AM meeting in Redford and the whole room was smoking, but then there was a little room that was a non-smoking room <laughs> and it was like just as smoky, but it had like kind of a door that separated it. But I swear, I must've smelled like cigarettes. I got, you know, but it was crazy, right? You can't even see people, but stereotypical yeah, alcoholics. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yes, we don't do so anything did you, halfway. Yeah. That's for sure. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so tell me a little bit about like, did you go on to more school after high school or what did you kind of do? Like, how did you grow and evolve after that? Well, um, I did, uh, go to college, just went to, to local community college uh, for a couple of years, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I thought about it years later, it occurred to me that while my upbringing was not movie of the wing, excuse me, movie of the week drama. It was, um, it was dysfunctional. It wasn't, the focus wasn't on what was best for my brother and I, the focus was on our, because of some other addiction issues in my family, uh, were they going to be able to keep the house? And the focus was on, were my parents going to stay together or not? And the focus was on a lot of other things, but it was not on what was best for my brother and I. And when I have conversations with my own kids uh, over the years about college and what they need from us and what, what they're interested in, those conversations never happened in my household. So I never really thought, what do I want? You know, what do I want to do? And what am I good at? What would, what would be fulfilling to me? What would be interesting to me? So those, those just weren't conversations that ever happened. 
And then in recovery, that wasn't the focus that, you know, the focus wasn't on, you know, how, how, how am I going to support myself as an adult? And what is that going to look like? So I just did what was in front of me. I just did the next right thing. And, um, but I was well taken care of in that regard because while I was in school, I was working and the job I was doing was just um, helping out a, a friend of the family in her office um, in, at her business. And I just picked up things here and there, found um, some things that I was just really good at and were interesting to me. And uh, that evolved into now, I, well, actually I just accepted a, a position doing something slightly different, but um, over the last 20 some years, I've worked at a C-suite level as an executive assistant. And it, it's interesting because people sometimes think of that as, you know, just administrative work, but it's actually this really interesting, really right in the middle of everything position and just get involved at, in the heart of the organization, whatever organization I'm working in. And I love every minute of it because I genuinely care about the people that I work with and I care about the health of the overall organization and exactly, you know, the nuts and the bolts of how all the logistics work to make things run efficiently and well and, well, quite frankly, make money and just be successful overall. And some of that is, is vestiges of liking to be the hero. Uh, which was my role in our family growing up. Uh, not that I got to do that a whole lot, but that was that was uh, a, a role that I, I took on uh, when I was younger. And so there is some of that in there. I, I really do like to be the hero. And I, I often get to do that at work. But um, the role I have now is actually a little bit different where it's a, it's a personal executive assistant. So there's there's a little bit different focus, but it's it's a lot of the same thing in that, I'm constantly handling logistics and fixing problems. And um, I really love it, but it isn't something I went to school for. I've gone to school, I've gone to do specific training in different skill sets, different areas, and toyed around with the idea of getting an MBA, but it's not necessary for the work. It would just strictly be for my own satisfaction if I were to go back to school. But so, school, while it's something I actually really enjoyed college quite a bit, um, that didn't lead me to a career, but it did give me some confidence to do it well. And um, I've always been well-read and fairly articulate. And I think that was strengthened um, by just simply attending uh, college for a couple of years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like you found your way and in... You found your path, which I think is wonderful. Um, I love that being the hero. Uh, do, do you have a particular hero that you like? Like I know, like do you watch any of those movies, like Marvel or uh, uh, any of those? All of them. <laughs> yeah. All of them. Who's your favorite? Love them all. Yeah. Well, uh, my my husband would say this is be because of um, that. Many of our friends are a little bit like this. Is um, that I, I love Iron Man's absolute snark and um, r ridiculousness and and even his self-centeredness. Not that I would necessarily want to live with someone like that, but he's highly entertaining to watch in <laughs> movies. And uh, I, I like my I like my hero flawed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, he definitely is Tony Stark. <laughs> he's definitely that. Yeah, I like his relationship though with uh, Gwyneth. I forget her name in the shows, but yeah, she's it's a nice. Yeah. Good relationship, I guess, kind of. But uh, who's yeah. who's your favorite? Well, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I just watched a three-hour Batman the other day, which I know is not Marvel. That's different, but it was good. Have you seen the new Batman? Actually, no, I don't. Think okay, I have. it's streaming on HBO, but uh, it was good. But yeah, I like. I don't know. I watched that Shang Chi recently. The one, you know, the the new Asian superhero. Ten that rings? was a super cool movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, was... that was very fun. Yeah. My daughter's really into all that, more than me. Um, 
Actually, so, uh, this that is something my son and I tend to do together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is super fun, right? I think that's great. Um, I love so it. in 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 your twenty years of business, have you seen addiction in the workplace? Does that ever come up, or are you just kind of working and then nobody bothers you with that? Do people ever come to you and ask your opinion, or have you seen seen it? Actually, just given the kind of workplaces um, that I've had in, in smaller businesses, or at least the people that I physically worked with, because um, I, I've had remote team members, so that obviously you don't have as much personal that uh, gets just casually thrown about. Um, but given the work environments, I haven't actually had a lot of it come up outside of myself. And, but I've been very clear with the people I work with that I don't drink and I make sure they don't shake because I have a food allergy. So I've had actually to clarify that, um, cause I, I have, um, a gluten allergy. So I, I have once had someone try to give me gluten-free beer because he thought I didn't drink simply because of the gluten allergy. I'm like, no, <laughs> two separate things. Um, so I, I'm just, just makes it simpler if I let people know I don't drink and I don't, I don't in the workplace, I don't uh, tell them why, unless it comes up. If mm -hmm. it comes up, I, I don't hide it, especially after a number of years sober. And, and especially after I know people have worked with them for a period of time, but um, it actually has come up shockingly little because apparently no one cares. No one really cares that I'm sober. Only because I am sober. Obviously, mm -hmm. we both know that if I were not sober, I, well, I know that I would become unemployable fairly quick. Mm -hmm. And um, then they might care that I was not doing my job. But um, but because I am sober, no one that I work with tends to care. I have ever had people ask additional questions about why I didn't drink or if had I ever drank or did I just, or is this something I've just never done? And, um, after just answering a couple of questions, like, yes, I did used to drink and that's why I don't drink now. Um, that, that has been the end of the conversation. So it's actually not something that has come up in an opportunity to be of service in the workplace in other, in other situations it has in with, family, although with family, that's, that's always funny because after I got sober the first few years, anytime there was conversation about anything happening with my cousins or any, any, any drama in the family, they, they would just completely stop talking when I, when I got anywhere in the vicinity, which I found hysterical, like I was somehow, I don't know, like they just couldn't talk about somebody drinking around me or something. They were fine drinking around me, by the way but they wouldn't talk about anything that was really funny. But, um, but in some other, other, uh, situations with actually, um, something had come up with, um, one of my children through their school and, uh, talking with a faculty member that I ab was able to turn them onto some resources for a student they were trying to help. So things do come up socially and I'm, I'm open about my recovery when it's, so when it serves a purpose, but professionally, I am fairly careful about it. Although simply because I've been sober as long as I have, I'm not concerned that anyone will care if they already know me, know that I'm competent, know that I, I'm good at what I do. At that point, they won't care. Mm -hmm. I don't like people knowing professionally when they don't have any additional information. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's definitely something that I don't introduce into my workplace right off the bat mm -hmm. because yeah. some people do have preconceived ideas and I don't want that to get in the way. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of young people coming in today. Uh, a lot of young women, do you, you know, through this podcast, do you want to share any advice if, uh, someone's young and considering coming in here that, uh, maybe might be able to help them? Absolutely. It was a huge help to me when I was able to connect with people that were close to my own age. And 
I had some wonderful people who were supportive. And like I said, these, these people who just kind of took me under their wing in, in uh, Dearborn where I first got sober, but I don't know that I would have stayed sober, that I would have continued going to meetings, but there are so many more young people at meetings now. Some of that is simply because of um, treatment centers being available and, and some of it is just simply more awareness and, and things online and people getting, having the ability to get information before actually darkening the door of a meeting, which seems very dramatic the first time you do it. It's, uh, it's pretty scary, but, um, but there are so many more young people at meetings now and there, there's just, um, there's just so much more support and understanding of the fact that a 16 year old woman can absolutely be an alcoholic and that uh, women, our, our bodies actually tend to have negative effects due to alcohol and drugs quicker because um, our, our bodies are just different and some often smaller. And the way we process drugs and alcohol tends, it, it tends to cost us physically uh, sooner than it does men. But, um, but really it was that just having the ability to connect with women, which is funny because I didn't want anything to do with women because the way I was raised and, and through my own insecurities and use, um, I didn't, I didn't trust many women in my life. But after I got sober, once I finally started to get to know some, some young women and spend time with them, they're the ones that saved my life. They're the ones that really understood me in a way that no one else did. And that is what I would say is as soon as possible, as much as possible to seek out other sober young women. And if there's an opportunity, some that have a couple of years sober time or more. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. You know, and I agree with you. It's, it's, uh, you know, coming into the rooms, it was a place where I'm like, you know, I'm not alone. There's others like me. And I also really liked how people shared at meetings because it was very different than you hear anywhere else in the world. You know, nobody really talks like that. Um, people in the outside world are always like, oh, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Fine. Great. Smile. You know, but in, a, in <laughs> meetings, they really get real. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. When, when, when I go to a meeting and another alcoholic asks me, how are you doing? They want a real answer and they expect one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that is amazing. Actually, it's funny because I've ever in the you know outside world, I had somebody ask me how I'm doing and I gave them a real answer and um, get interesting looks when you do that. <laughs> right. I didn't really mean that. <laughs> yeah. I was like back at a lot of the room. Yeah. yeah. So, Michelle, do you plan on sticking around? I mean, you've got how many? Uh, 32 years now? 30? Now, thir 31. Okay. 31. So you have 31 years now. Do you plan on sticking around for, for the long haul? You in it, to win, in it to win it? Yeah, I absolutely plan to continue to go to meetings for as long as I'm alive. I, Alcoholics Anonymous is one of those things that um, it provides a, a framework for my life and my life is going to continue to happen. And situations change. I mean, when I was I I didn't I will have to do the math as how many years how, how many years sober was I when I had my daughter how many years sober was I when I got married how many years so you know with each major life change um my life is different and my experience is different and what I need is different and the support and the help that I need just in the world is different and um so at every change everything that I need um meetings and my community in recovery and every everything to do with continuing to attend meetings. I need that support, but it's, it's interesting because when I, the first few years I was sober, I thought of it as being something I needed, like, like I need to eat my vegetables. You know, I don't necessarily, I've, I've grown to like some, but uh, I don't necessarily want to work out. I don't necessarily want to eat healthy. Um, but I know I need to. It was like that for a long time, but actually I love going to meetings and I still need them. And I, I feel that I always will, but 
my favorite people are at, at meetings and, and some of the most like hysterical um, people that I just, I honestly could just listen to for hours. And, um, you know, my, my best friends, you know, those are the people that I see when I go and it is on, such a gift to be able to connect with these people. And I, while I wouldn't necessarily have to give up all of those friendships. There's absolutely something would be lost, even if I were able to not go to meetings, but never, never pick up another drink or a drug. My life would be significantly less rich if I didn't go to meetings. But the truth is, I think that eventually I would drink again if I quit going to meetings. But it's it. I go, but I I go because. I don't ever want to drink again because I, I know that would I would probably burn my life down prior to even picking up and that's could definitely go into that more if, if you wish but um but I honestly I would miss I would miss all the people I wouldn't at times when uh, both of my children you know when when you have babies in the house everything becomes about them because they're, you're literally keeping them alive. <laughs> everything you do is, so there have been times in my life when I haven't gone to many, many meetings and that got very isolating very quickly. And I really missed the people at the meetings, but I also missed that sense of purpose and belonging. Okay. So you just said something about burning it all down. If I wanted to learn more, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I am curious because I think that might help help people like, what do you mean? Um, just that uh, there are a, a couple of different circumstances under which I could imagine if I were to ever drink again, even after all these years, if I were to ever drink again, um, the two situations, you know, would be if I literally felt like my life was such a, a garbage heap that it didn't, nothing matter. Um, and the other is, well, I guess... Similarly, it is essentially if I wanted to drink myself to death, because um, I, I don't believe there are any circumstances under which I could convince myself I'm not really an alcoholic. Because, as I mentioned earlier, of all the meetings I've gone to over 31 years, I have never come out of a meeting and thought, I can't relate to anything anyone said. That has never happened. There's always something I hear that to just clicks. And and it, as if somebody could hear hear things going on in my head, that um, there was there's always been a connection in every single meeting I've ever been to. So there's there's no part of me that believes that maybe it was a mistake, maybe I was really just young, and maybe it was normal experimentation. There's no part of me that believes that. But there is there is um, this voice it's so quiet but if i'm not going to meetings if i'm not taking care of myself if i'm just not well um it gets a little louder and that voice tells me that i'm i'm not good enough I mean, i'm not i'm not a good mother i'm not a good friend i'm not a good partner to my husband i'm not a good employee um there there are a hundred different ways that can manifest but but that that voice telling me that you know none of this really matters anyhow that yeah, well, if I ever become convinced, and so if I become convinced that I'm not good enough and that my um, and any of the good that I'm doing in the world isn't isn't doesn't matter, isn't going to make a difference, isn't going to help anyone, um, if I actually believed that, I would be burning bridges and and things in my life would become a giant mess before I ever picked up a drink, and and that's that's what I mean. I've said I'm. I've said this before at meetings, I'm fully capable of burning my life to the ground without ever picking up a drink. And, and that's what I mean by that is that that alcoholic behavior that happens long before we ever pick up a drink or a drug. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. I, I, a friend of mine used to say either we're every choice we make is moving towards a drink or away from a drink. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And if I go towards too often, then I will drink, you know, so. Agreed. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I feel lucky that I, that I know you, right? So we know each other from a few meetings. I think your shares are wonderful. I love that you're still so involved uh, with 31 years sober. I love that because AA, the program, uh, women coming up need positive influences. 
guys need positive influences. You know, I think we all need people that we can say, wow, they did it, you know? So I think it's really important to show up. Um, so I'm really grateful you do that. I, well, you know this, I, <clears throat> I've really in, enjoyed your shares as well. And I love hearing you talk about your, your family and for whatever reason, fishing, I don't know what that's about, <laughs> but you know, you will th throw the occasional, uh, um, goofy story in, but <laughs> I, one of the, one of the reasons why actually I've always enjoyed connecting with you at meetings is because we laugh a lot and I didn't laugh much before I got sober and was really sober, not just attended a couple of meetings, but really got involved in the program. And I laugh a lot at meetings. Yeah. It's good to have fun at meetings. I agree. It's my main social activity kind of <laughs> uh, happens. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. Well, uh, so thank you, Michelle, for being on the recovering CEO podcast and, uh, I'm sure our listeners are going to enjoy this. And listeners, thanks for listening. And I'm going to you could say goodbye. I Don't leave, but we'll just uh, say goodbye. <laughs> okay. Well, goodbye. Thank you for uh, asking me to do this. All right. Thank you, Michelle. You thought that you could have it all. And life could be a ball. Fell and scabbed your knee